Hi everyone, good afternoon. Welcome to the May uh, construction webinar. Um, my name is Tashir Rasool. I'm an attorney here at uh, Lois Law Firm. For those of you joining me for the very first time, I am uh, a partner here. I am the leader of the construction practice group here at uh, Lois Law Firm. Um, this year we started a webinar series that's focused on construction, uh, New York workers' compensation claims. I've been going through the very basics of New York uh, workers', uh, workers compensation law, um, New York labor law, which plays a very big role. I've gone through uh, the basics of uh, wrap-ups, OSIPs, CSIPs, and today we're going to continue our discussion about wrap-ups and how to prepare for the loss. All right, so this is what we'll discuss today assembling the team before the loss, uh, the initial response at the time of the loss, and I'll give you a COVID-19 update at the end of the webinar. And then there's gonna be a live Q&A. There is a box at the side of, oh, here are my webinars. I hear my slides a little out, <laughs> out of order, I'm sorry. But this is what the box is gonna look like um, for you to type your questions in. Uh, towards the end, remember it's live, put your questions, I'll answer them. If we don't get to them, I'll definitely send you an email. Uh, just a reminder, um, the construction uh, handbook is available via both PDF and hard copy. This is something that's new this year. It's focused on defending construction claims in New York. If you'd like a copy, please send me an email and I'd like uh, I'll, I'll get you the copies, whether it's a PDF or a hard copy. Um, I created this book especially for uh, risk managers and employers and um, uh, insurance carriers. It focuses on uh, issues arising out of defending construction claims in New York. And like I mentioned previously, I uh, head up the construction practice team here at Lois Law Firm. As you may or may not know, this is a very unique to workers' compensation uh, defense firms in New York. Uh, all of our attorneys uh, handle only workers' compensation claims that arise out of construction accidents, and we work very closely with general liability attorneys. So if you have any questions about any of that, feel free to let me know. It doesn't have to be just about this webinar. It can be about anything. And again, if you'd like a copy of my handbook, please let me know, and I'll get it to you. All right, so live question answer, don't forget. All right, let's start with who should be on the team. So in the prior webinars, I talked about, you know, the, the basics of a wrap-up. It can be an OSIP or a CSIP. And I mentioned that there are a number of parties that are involved in a wrap-up project and an OSIP project. And we, we briefly touched upon who should be on the team at the last webinar, I'd like to go through that a little more <clears throat> this month so that we have an understanding of how many parties are involved in, in, in such a project. All right, so <clears throat> remember, wrap up, it can be an OSIP or a CSIP. OSIP is Owner Controlled Insurance Program, a CSIP is a Contractor Controlled Insurance Program. So first of all, we have the owner or the general contractor. The owner can be um, a construction management company, a developer, it can be a governmental organization, or it can be just any private company that's doing uh, construction work in any given area. The, if it's a CSIP, that means the general contractor is usually responsible for taking out the wrap-up policy and administering the wrap-up policy. So we definitely have the owner or the general contractor as a key component in the wrap-up team. Then there's the broker. Um, most of the wrap-ups I've seen, they enlist a broker to uh, create um, a wrap-up plan, the project, and to work with the insurance carrier to develop uh, policies that protect their interests the best. And some brokers also do um, uh, risk management on behalf of the employer and are very involved. And then there's the insurance carrier. They're the ones who write the insurance policy, uh, include all of the terms of the, the, the coverages, what's excluded, what's not. 
the underwriter the underwriter is usually a very important um, person when it comes to coverage issues sometimes we have them come in to testify so it's always good to know who the underwriter is then there's a TPA the third party administrator so in all of the wrap-ups I've seen it's usually an insurance carrier and it's being uh, in, administered by a third party organization they're the ones that are in the forefront of the claim they're the ones handling the claim on a daily basis taking in all of the information making decisions about how to proceed with the claim how to litigate accept deny all of that stuff the safety team because of the magnitude of these construction projects the wrap-ups usually have a safety team that's designated for the project there's a number of people, sometimes they're external vendors or just individuals, and there's also a safety plan um, in order to manage uh, the, the work that's being done on the job site. There's also, most oftentimes, a, an on-site nurse or medic to take care of injured workers, especially if it's something minor, or even if it's something major, they're, they act as the, the, the first responder, so to say, on the job site um calling the ambulance or taking them to the urgent care or to the hospital and so forth and then there is an investigation team this is very very important and we'll go over that a little more but because of the nature of a construction job site um the the investigation team is very very important and they should be deployed from the very first day so that's an overview of who should be on this team I know a lot of times when we deal with workers' compensation claims, we only know about the employer, the insurance carrier, and the TPA, and communication is usually done amongst those three, well, include uh, plus the workers' comp defense counsel. But in a wrap-up, we need to know who all of these parties are because each one of them plays an important role in the administration of a claim, in defending a claim, and we need to be constantly communicating with them. All right. Other vendors should also be included on the team. <clears throat> For example, surveillance, IME vendors, <clears throat> MSA vendors. And I know the focus here is preparing for the loss. And these, these, uh, these vendors should be vetted before the, the, the project even started. We should have them ready because we might need surveillance from day one. We might need an IME within the first month or so. Um, MSA, if we want to do like a quick uh, a settlement and the uh, injured worker has to get an MSA, we need to have all of these lined up so we're not spending time trying to get them once the claim is actively in motion. Workers' Compensation Defense Council, you need one. I know I'm not only saying this because I'm a, a defense counsel, but I think it's very, very important to have them lined up before the project starts and get them involved from the very first day, especially if it's a catastrophic injury. And the reason I'm saying this is we work closely with the investigators, the, um, the safety team, the medic, and also the broker in order to come up with a defense, uh, defense plan. We also work closely with the General Liability Defense Council because I'll tell you, 99% of these claims are usually turned into a third party claim also under the New York scaffold law because it involves some kind of a fall or under some kind of other negligence provisions under New York labor law. So it's very important to have your defense counsel, both workers comp and a general liability defense counsel lined up before the accident even happens. This is when you're in the planning stage. As soon as the accident happens, deploy them, have them have conversations with an investigator. I personally, when I speak with the investigator, when a claim first comes in, I give them a number of questions to ask the witnesses. This is what I need uh, A through Z to defend my claim. This is what the adversary and the claimant's gonna be arguing. This is what the judges are gonna be looking at. So give them an outline. I've noticed that the investigators' reports are usually kind of boilerplate in terms like the format, but in order to properly defend a workers' compensation claim uh, that arises out of a construction accident, I think it needs to be more tailored to what the judges actually look for in workers' compensation court. 
The other thing is too, I've seen investigation reports that are focused mainly on the, ge the general liability of the third party defense. It has good information they can use, but there's other small information that we need in workers' compensation sometimes. So it's very important to have your defense counsel uh, in touch with the investigators in the very beginning. We also like talking to the medic team or the on-site nurse and the safety people so we know exactly um, when the accident occurred, what happened, who reported what, uh, what documentation was completed. If they have to do uh, subsequent investigations, we're able to provide guidance. Hey, this is what we need from you. This is what you need to ask the witness. Um, this is the evidence that you need to collect and give it to the investigators. So it's very important that you um, bring in your workers' comp defense uh, attorney from the very, very beginning. All right, so getting the team together. So it'll all look great on paper, getting all of these all of these parties together. However, if they don't know each other, if they don't know how the process is going to work, if they don't know how each other is going to work, this is going to be useless because when the claim is actually filed, we need action from the very first day. So what I've seen my clients do is before the start of the project, have a meeting with all of the stakeholders to explore everything that's going to happen on this project and how the how the machine's really going to work. So the phases of the project, if this is very, very important. And it's also important for your defense counsel to know what's covered and what's not covered in um, in the construction project. A lot of the, the 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 work that I do, demolition is not covered in the wrap-up. This is very important because uh, an, an employee, uh, a worker, and their company might very well need to be on the job. They're legally there. They're being paid to do the work there, but they're just not covered in the wrap-up. That's just an example of why it's important to d discuss the phases of the project. We also need to know what's going to happen in each phase of the project. You know, after the demolition, what happens next? Uh, how long is that phase going to last? When do we expect it to move over to the next phase? And this is important in terms of collecting evidence, knowing when contractors are going to change, knowing when the workers are probably going to leave the job site. So I think it's very important to um, for everyone to come together and have an understanding. The other thing that's really important is a drawing of the parameters of the project, because a lot of times these are massive projects we're talking about, and the claimant will say that it happened on the street at the corner of Avenue A and 41st Street or whatever it is. And the next thing you know, looking at the actual project site, that's not even covered. It's not part of the project. So, or it could be another facility, or maybe, for example, I guess it, the accident happened by the subway station, but it's not part of our project. So it's very important to know the parameters of the project, the phases, and every single person needs to know this. All right. Uh, the physical aspects of the job site, um, this uh, ties into the phases of the project, but essentially, you know, is it going to be a private residential building, a commercial building? Is it a school, an airport? Um, is it going to be completed, completely demolished or partially demolished? Uh, are there going to be like temporary fixtures for the workers? All of those things we need to know. Contractors. It's very important that we have a list of the proposed contractors, at least for the beginning. I know it's, it changes. It's organic as, as need arises. Um, more contractors are being brought in, but generally there's a list of contractors based on the type of work that's going to be carried out. Um, and it, it's good that we're familiar with who the general contractor is, who the main subcontractors are, because this way, when coverage issues come up, especially when the claimants say, well, you know, John Smith Construction is the one that's liable. John Smith's a general contractor, but they never hired the claimants. Uh, but there's like a sub 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 contractor who hired the claimants and then the sub 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 contractor is not even supposed to be on the job site and you know so just just knowing who's supposed to be there and who's not supposed to be there is really going to be helpful in defending the claims. Unions. Unions really complicate things especially in uh, construction claims 
because most of them are, most of the, the jobs hire only union workers. It's good to be familiar with, with the, the kind of work that's going to be done in which union, as you may or may not know, uh, every union has a specialty, you know, so there's a special union for the sand hogs, for the electricians, for carpentry, and so forth. So we we would, it, it would be good for everyone to know which union's going to be involved in the project. And it's also important to tell your defense attorneys, we've had experience with these unions. We know which ones turn over the records easily, which ones we need uh, a, a so-ordered subpoena, we know which ones are going to come in and testify in favor of the claimant, regardless of, of what's going on. Um, we know the ones that are going to be honest. We know the ones that are pushing the claimants to file claims. So definitely tell us all about the, the, the unions that you expect to be on your job site. Lingo and unique aspects of the job site. So, you know, every project, they come up with terms like, the walking boss or you know the, the the safety dude or however however colloquial they want to make it we should know we should be familiar with those terms so when a claim comes in the defense attorneys or the adjusters or even the brokers can say hey who was the walking boss in that day or who was the safety dude or you know whatever other lingo they come up with it's good to be familiar with that um private companies usually have uh sophisticated terminologies that they use. Governmental uh, companies usually have uh, other kind of terminologies that they use. It just fits within their culture. So it's good to know what's gonna be used. And so when there's a big discussion about the claim, everyone knows who we're talking about. All right, anticipated hazards and obstacles. Um, this is important uh, because, we, because these may not be covered, first of all. The claimants may be wandering off into a hazardous area or doing work in a hazardous area when they're not supposed to be there. So if anything that you know that's going to be present in the project, please share that with the team. Or it could be anything as small as, you know, an, an abundance of uh, gas pipes running across the project or at the corner of a busy train station or a busy intersection. Um, these are all key facts that we need to know in defending the claims. And I think it's important because when the adjuster is doing the investigation or when the broker or the owner is asking questions about where exactly it happened, was that area, um, were, were there barricades around the area where they're not supposed to be there, we should be able to have an idea of, of what's going on or was, was this expected or anticipated. So this is a, these are just some of the key points that everyone should meet together before the project starts to discuss. These meetings can last anywhere from a couple of hours to an entire day. It's usually um, fact intensive and there's a lot of information, but there's also a policy manual that contains a lot of this information, which I'll talk about next. Now, oh, the safety team and the medic, we went over that also. Um, we need to involve them in the meeting. All right, so as a part of getting the team together, here's what we propose. And we've seen wrap-ups do it and be successful, and we've seen wrap-ups that don't really do it and no one knows what's going on, and then it's a big mess when the claim comes in. So it's important to publish the team contacts and the OSIP or the CSIP for the wrap-up manual. This contains all of the information I just talked about. Um, it's an overview of the project. It's, um, it contains like a directory of the, the people we should contact, the phone number, the, the email address, even physical addresses. The insurance carriers and the TPAs usually have a sample of their forms that need to be filled out at the time of an accident. The medic or the safety uh, team may also have a sample of the forms that need to be filled out. And this is usually widely available. The, the manual, it's provided to the contractors. Anyone interested in knowing what's going on in the project can obtain a copy. It's usually published on the wrap-ups website, which is easy to access. So it's very important that one of these is made available to everyone. <clears throat> Set up a timeline for action to be taken. So this is also very important. And what I'm talking about is, well, 
let's say an accident occurs regardless of whether or not we are contesting the accident all right so even in a case where we know an accident occurred and it was catastrophic we can't wait we can't sit back so we need to set up a timeline and what i mean is within <clears throat> 24 hours of the accident happening, A, B, and C must occur. Investigation must be sent out. Um, the medic team must submit a report. The safety team must submit a report. Defense counsel must be called in. Um, then within 48 hours, you know, list the things that you want to happen. Within a week, we need a full investigation report. Within uh, two weeks, we need a second investigation, find additional witnesses, so forth. I think it's very, very important because the more we sit on the claim, the less, uh, the, 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 less the, the less we're able to properly defend it. Our defense weakens as every minute goes by. Um, outline loss reporting rules. So this is going to be mainly for the safety team and the broker and the owner, the employer, they should all know when a loss occurs what needs to be done you know maybe the the walking boss needs to be contacted this needs to be communicated to the workers they usually have their week the, their weekly toolbox meetings or their bi-weekly meetings um, during the coffee breaks and this information is usually conveyed to them because oftentimes we have client uh, claimants who say Oh, I didn't know I was supposed to do this. I didn't know I was supposed to contact this person or call this person, but I told this person who doesn't even exist. So I think it's important to know um, an outline and ensure that everyone's educated on the loss reporting rules. So the safety, the, the safety team knows when an accident occurs, these are the papers and documents that we need to get filled out. It's then provided to the uh, TPA directly or to the broker, whoever it is, there must be a process there. Run a drill. It is very, very important to run a drill. I know, I know, it sounds like who has time to run a drill when nothing's happening, when we have to get 200 people together, all coordinating phone calls, conference calls, pretending to go out to the job site and all that stuff. But trust me, it works. I've done these drills with clients and I think it's very, very helpful. And even though we have the meetings, the OSIP manuals, the, all of the training, when we did the actual drill, it was a little chaotic because it was the first time. And doing things in reality is very different from having it on paper and everyone sitting in a room discussing it. So it really helps to iron out some glitches and some problems you can go through, uh, that you can run, in through, run into and when the first claim comes in everyone knows what to do all right so at the time of loss let's talk about that so the initial response is key oops it's very very important like i said start your investigation don't delay it even if it's a small claim because like i said the majority of these turn, in, turn into a multi-million dollar third-party claim the guy got an ouchie on his pinky finger, then it run, runs up to his hand, and then his arm, and then the back, and then it goes down to the leg, and then he's PTSD, and we're off to the races with that claim, all right? And by the time we get there, we don't have all of the information to defend the additional body parts um, because the witnesses are gone or things like that. So the reason it's important to do this is to start off on the right foot, to start off with a strong defense to ensure that we have the information we need to defend this claim in the event that it becomes a total body claim. I know in a lot of cases, when it's just like a pinky finger or a hand claim, we might be inclined to say, mm, he's gonna be out of work for two weeks and then he's gonna come back, it's gonna be you know, a short period of indemnity, medical, and he'll be fine. But trust me, I've seen this over and over and over. It turns into a really big disaster. So the inve in initial investigation should be on site. Get your investigators, the same one that you vetted prior to the project starting, get them out to the job site right away. And I'm talking less than 24 hours. I know these investigators work around the clock. As soon as word of the accident uh, comes in, I think you need to get them out. 
And the reason we need to get them out is because the job site is organic. It's, it's moving constantly. You know, witnesses leave, equipments move, evidence is moved, things are hidden. You never know what's going on. So you need to get them out there right away. Like I mentioned, not that I'm selling myself or anything, but get your attorney involved. Um, yeah, I think it's, I, I really do think it's going to be uh, great for your defense plan, especially knowing what happened, where it happened in the very beginning. Like I said, we can talk to investigators, give them uh, an outline of the things that they need to look for and get the ball rolling for when the claim is actually filed. All right, so I did touch in some of these but I'll go in to them a little more. So like I said, the job site is a change in organization, organism. So we move from demolition to phase one overnight. Everything's cleared out. Remember, there's a number of contractors and uh, people working there, so things happen really quickly. A lot of the equipment that injure the claimant are moved every hour or every minute or depending on how the work's going. For example, a ladder. We see so many claims where claimants fall off a ladder. But guess what? The ladder, as soon as the claimant falls off and he's off there, someone else takes that ladder and they move it to a different area or it just disappears miraculously. I don't know. But that's why it's very important to get your team on there very, very quickly. Workers and trades leave. So, a worker might be there for just one day, and he was the key witness that we really need to tell us what exactly happened. It might be the contractor's last day on the job. The claimant knows this, and this is why he got into an accident, right? So we might not be able to be in touch with these uh, companies and witnesses, key witnesses, after they leave. Um, equipment and tools are being moved all the time, like I mentioned. Even, even the bigger equipment, the bulldozer, the, uh, the, the crane, the rolling machine, the cement mixer, those things are always moving and on the go because, you know, work really goes on. Unless it's really catastrophic, unless a death occurs, the work just keeps going. The worker, you know, one of his buddies take him to the medic's office or the on-site nurse's office, and then the work just keeps continuing. And it's hard to actually recreate the area where it happened. So it's very important to do this investigation. Surveillance. Now, a lot of the construction sites don't have surveillance while the construction's going on. And I can see why. It's because it's so changing. There's nowhere to actually put the surveillance. There's like lots of uh, scaffolding and temporary walls blocking where the claimants are working. But what's really important is surveillance from neighboring buildings, especially if you're in a place like New York City. I feel like every single building in New York City has sort of video surveillance, um, you know, security cameras. And it's important to identify whether there's one that may have captured the accident and um, try to retrieve it as soon as possible. We might need to issue a subpoena. They might uh, cooperate in providing us with a copy. But the thing is, they're taped over. They're taped over maybe every two weeks or every 30 days. So by the time we're in court trying to defend a claim against all body parts, we're not able to get that surveillance anymore. I know a lot of times we think about surveillance as covert surveillance and that it happens uh, later on in the case when we're trying to address something like degree of disability or whether this guy's actually okay or if he's working. But it's very important to consider other kinds of surveillance, meaning like security surveillance, from the very beginning of a claim. All right, so that's, that's my overview on getting ready for the loss and what to do when the loss occurs. I know it, it might sound, well, all right, this is something we know. Why do we need to talk about this? But like I said, I've seen wrap-ups that don't go through all of this, that don't provide all of the information to all of the stakeholders and the parties involved. And it's a disaster when a claim is filed. We can't get the information we need. No one knows where things, uh, where, where documents are, uh, who's supposed to have the information. And then I've seen ones that work really well, the ones that actually do all of these, including running the drill. All right, so COVID-19, we know that's, our lives are revolving around COVID-19 right now. So I just wanted to give you a little bit of update what we're seeing. As you know, 
Workers' Compensation Board has been virtual for a few years now, so the hearings were not affected when uh, the COVID-19 pandemic struck. All of the hearings were going forward. Um, so we're 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 in full motion. We're litigating cases like nothing's ever happened. And some things for you to know are construction sites are slowly reopening. So initially it was only the the essential construction job sites that were open, but we our clients told us that some of the non-essential ones are getting permission from the city and state to reopen. So just keep an eye out when you know no one's showing up to work and they're filing all these COVID-19 claims. Um, it j just keep an eye on when they last worked, the date of loss they're claiming, uh, whether the project was actually open or not, so we can tee up our defense for these claims. Um, initially, with the uh, with the hearings, the board was just given first available calendar and not giving um, date certains, but now they are starting to give uh, date certains or at least within like a month. So first available within, first available in June. They're also scheduling trials in very short notice. So this is something we should keep in mind if your attorney told you three weeks ago that the trial is gonna be uh, on the first available calendar we already start seeing them scheduled within two weeks. So it'll be time to tee up your witnesses and get all of your investigation in place. So just keep an eye out for the quick um, scheduling of hearings because it's really going to get busy. We've also been seeing that IME vendors are giving dates again. This is also something to keep in mind. I think the board's slowly getting back on track in terms of a couple of um, a couple of things that it you know put a hold on which were the IMEs and the labor market attachments so definitely uh, schedule those IMEs as soon as your you, your vendor starts getting the dates so we can start reducing benefits getting the claimant back to work uh, pursuing labor market attachment even more and moving towards classification otherwise though um, nothing else from the board the board hasn't announced anything with regards to any other changes because of COVID-19. Just a reminder, we're still uh, encouraging our clients to deny these claims um, because there's been no change in the law, no regulation, nothing under workers' compensation law saying that these are presumptive uh, compensable claims and that we should be accepting them. There are rumors out there. I know the board issued this notice to the stakeholders uh, pretty much saying, hey, uh, accept these COVID-19 claims. We need to help our workers out. But we all know that New York has um, um, amended its law and the claimants or the, the, the workers who suffered from COVID-19 can get relief under the, the family, New York family law. So that's the avenue they should be pursuing, not workers' compensation. If you have any questions about that, we have seen workers' compensation claims come in for COVID-19 and we've already come up with a strategy for defending them. So if you have a claim, whether it's one that we're handling or it's just something you have a general question about, feel free to contact me, let me know, and I'll get you some answers. All right, so before we get to the question and answers, um, what's next? Can you believe it's June already next month? We're all almost halfway through this year, through this uh, construction webinar series. So for the rest of the year, we're gonna be talking about legal issues and coordinating defense. And you know, some of these are issues uh, that we see in a, a regular workers' compensation claim, but I'll talk about how it's more complicated in a construction claim. Legal defense best practices, we'll go over those. We'll talk about global settlements. Those are loved a lot in rapid projects. Relevant laws and real life examples, I try to give those as much as I can. Um, all right, so let's see if we have any questions. Oh, I don't see any questions. All right, I guess I did a good job. <laughs> if you do have any questions, uh, send me an email, I'll get back to you. Also, we do have an agenda plan for the rest of the year, and I do intend to continue this next year, but I'm starting to think about it for next year. 
So if there's anything you'd like to see me discuss in the webinar, please let me know. Um, I can incorporate it in one, to, one of the future webinars, or I may create a special segment for you, but please do let me know. All right, so thank you all for joining. Stay safe. Uh, let me know if you have any questions, and I'll see you right here, same time, uh, first Monday of June. Take care, everyone.